I'm the Amateur Logician from AmateurLogician.com. We're going to work through a proof in propositional logic. We have premise 1, if P, then Q and R. Premise 2, if S, then T or P. Premise 3, if T, then U and R. And we want to prove if S, then R. From the outset, it's not clear what to do. In cases like this, sometimes we should try an indirect proof, a reductio ad absurdum proof. Moreover, if we have all these conditionals, if P, then Q, if P, then Q, if P, then Q, so to speak, it's often a good idea to resort to what's called implication, where we can turn that conditional hypothetical proposition into a disjunction. We're going to try an indirect proof. So for line four, let's just deny or contradict what we want to prove. In other words, we will assume not parentheses if S, then R. And this is an assumption. And as such, we will place it, so to speak, under quarantine. For our purposes, we will place it in a box. We'll then resort to implication and turn this if S then R into a disjunction. So for line five, we can get not parentheses, not S or R, and that's an implication line four. Under quarantine still, based on that assumption, we have a denial of this disjunction here, so we can apply De Morgan Line six, not, not S, and not R. D. Morgan, line five. Let's clean this up. We have the double negation, a not, not S. So for line seven, we can get S and not R. Double negation, line six. For eight, we can get that S. And then with line two, we can engage in a modus ponens inference. So for 8, we'll get S, simplification, line 7, again under quarantine. And then for 9, we can get our T or P by modus ponens with lines 2 and 8. Continuing, let's get that not R from line 7. But to be very careful, let's resort to the commutative rule first. So for line 10, we can get not R and S. Community rule, line 7. And then for 11, we can get our not R by the simplification of 10. Well, I think we should try to get a T somehow in order to do a modus ponens inference with line 3. And we can resort to an indirect proof within an indirect proof. Now, proofs that require that are usually tricky, but it is something we have to do sometimes. And let's just do it. So for line 12, we'll make another assumption. Let's just assume not T. And again, it's under quarantine, but it's an assumption within an assumption. We can make use of line 9 with a disjunctive syllogism. We have T or P, not T. So for 13, we can get P by our disjunctive syllogism with lines 9 and 12. Again, under quarantine. In this case, we have an assumption within an assumption. Note that line 1 has that P in the antecedent and the Q and R in the consequent. Let's do a modus ponens inference. So if P, then Q and R. P, therefore Q and R. So for 14, we can get Q and R by modus ponens with lines 1 and 13. Again, under quarantine, so to speak. Let's get that R. So for 15, we can get R and Q by the commutative rule with line 14. And then for 16, we can get R by the simplification of 15. But note, we have a contradiction because we have a not R and an R. So for 17, we can get R and not R by the conjunction rule with lines 11, or I should say maybe 16 and 11. So therefore, because this assumption leads to this contradiction, for 18, we can say not not T by our indirect proof or a reductio ad absurdum proof with lines 12 through 17. 
but we're still under quarantine, remember. Let's clean this up. For 19, we have that double negation. So we can get T, double negation, 18. But then we have that T. And remember, for line 3, we have that if T, then U and R. Let's do a modus ponens. So for 20, let's get U and R by modus ponens with lines 3 and 19. Let's get that R, because note that we're going to get another contradiction. So for 21, we'll get R and U, commutative rule, 20. We'll simplify, so 22, R, simplification, 21. And then let's combine this R and this not R. So for 23, we can get R and not R by the conjunction of 22 and 11. But note that this big assumption here, line, oop, line 4, we get this contradiction here. So outside of quarantine for 24, we have this not, not, parentheses, if S, then R, by our indirect proof with lines 4 through 23. And then just apply double negation to get if S, then R, 24. So therefore, it does follow that if S is the case, then R is the case. And we approve this with an indirect proof within an indirect proof. and shown that given these three premises, this conclusion does indeed follow. In any case, in this proof, we made an assumption within an assumption. Sometimes to get what we want, we should assume. For example, we wanted a t, so we tried to see what happens when we assume not t.